And today's lecture is really quite short because you pretty much know um, everything that, I was gonna, that I'm gonna say today in a different language. So we're only going to take what we've learned from kinematics, from linear kinematics, the stuff that we started the course with, and we're going to take that and we're going to think about it in a slightly different context in which things now are rotating instead of moving in a translational motion like this. So all of the things that you know and love from kinematics are gonna make an appearance today. D displacement, velocity, acceleration, um, and so on. So these things, the kinematic equations, all of these things are gonna make an appearance today, but they're gonna have a slightly different um, sort of twist to them not to be a pun, but in front of everything, it's going to be rotational something or angular something. So instead of displacement, it's going to be angular displacement. Velocity, angular velocity, acceleration, angular, and so on. So the word angular here is going to come in, but everything else is gonna show exactly the same um, as we've done before in kinematics. So this is gonna be a straightforward um, topic for you to um, to digest because it's really quite similar to what we've learned before. You know, I can go through the slides here or, um, you know, to, to explain things to you, but really at the end of the day, you'll see that it's just the word angular in front of everything. So for example, um, what we're thinking about here is rotational motion, right? So I'm thinking about a rigid object that is rotating. So something like this uh, ice skater is rotating about some axis of rotation here that represented by the dashed line here. This is gonna become a really important point for us to always try to find where the axis of rotation is. Whenever you're thinking about rotational motion, the axis of rotation becomes really, really critical, okay? So you see all of these points on the different parts of the object are undergoing this kind of circular motion. But every point on the object undergoes circular motion in some sense, or at least part of circular motion. And these circles are not necessarily the same size, right? So the different radii. So we'll see how that comes into play when we think about these variables. But the first variable, again, just like we talked about regular kinematics, the first thing we talked about is the idea of displacement. This is the word angular in front of it. So it's just angular displacement. If you remember displacement, the definition of it was that it's the change in position. The change in, we used the sine delta to talk about, and that was the change in position. Here, it's not the change in position, it's the change in angle. So the angle here counts as the position. That's the, uh, that's the analogy here. The angle theta, so suppose I have an object that is rotating like this. So suppose there's, um, do you know these things? You've seen these things before called CDs. So suppose you have one of those and it's going around, um, you know, the way they, you know, before CDs, there were these things called LDs, laser discs. They were about this big. That's why this one is called CD compact disc smaller than that. Anyway. anyway, suppose you have one of those CDs and it's rotating about this axis of rotation here. It's going around. Now suppose I draw a line on the CD like this, which by the way, you can do without harming the CD. You can draw a single line like that, really like that. But if you do, by the way, but if you do a line like this, that scratches the CD. So that makes it skip. But if you do a line like this, it's not a big deal, a radial line like that because the information is encoded redundantly here. So if you do it like this, then you're erasing a lot of information. Anyways, so if you draw a line like this on the CD and then you watch as that line is moving around, as this object is rotating, then you see that that line makes an angle um, that is changing. The angle is here at the center and that angle changes from initial angle, theta naught, to final angle theta. So remember with the linear displacement, we talked about the displacement as being the change in the position. So final minus initial, here it's the same kind of story. The change in the angle is the final angular position minus the initial angular position. So notice all the points on, on this line here change by the same angle. Even though they travel different distances, 
So the convention is that just like when we were solving kinematics, we had to make these axes for x and y, and we had to say which one we think is the positive side, like that. What we're going to think about for angle is we're going to try to fix the convention so that if you're if the angle is increasing in this direction counterclockwise, then we call that positive. So this sense here is the positive sense for theta. And there are many units for angle, right? I can measure angles in degrees. I can measure in radians. I can measure it in uh, things like revolutions, right? Or circles. Radians is the SI unit. And you know how to convert from these to go back and forth. For example, you can say, you know, one revolution is 360 degrees, right? That's a whole revolution around like that. So if this line starts here, goes around and comes back to the point it started from, it made one revolution or it made 360 degree rotation or also known as two pi radians. So about six and a quarter or so. So one revolution is about a six and a quarter or so radians. So one radian is actually quite big. One degree is very, very small, right? One degree is not even like, I can't even, it's really hard to draw one degree. So small, because this whole thing is 360 degrees. So one degree is very small, but one pi is not very small. So let's think about it. You have 360 degrees, you divided six and a quarter pieces. So it's about 60 degrees each. It's about 60 degrees, it's about this big. This here is one radian, which is about 60 degrees. If you calculate it, it comes out to 58 and change. So radians is the SI unit, and that's what we're going to prefer to use all the time when we're doing this, especially when we're doing anything that has to do with angular displacement when you put in equations. You have to always put theta in terms of radians. Okay? But, you know, in the problems or the situations you're thinking about and so on, you could have theta in degrees and then you convert to radians and so on. Let's do one of those conversions very quickly. Suppose, you know what, let me teach you something while we're doing it. Suppose I think about, I'm standing here on the surface of Earth and then here's the moon. By the way, this is not definitely not the scale because <laughs> the moon is, is not that big and it's much, much further away. So let me redraw it just a little bit. It's not even the scale still, but okay. Suppose this is the moon. And I wanna think about the angle that is subtended by the moon at my eyes. So when I look at the moon in the sky, it takes a certain space up there, right? Has a dimension that, what is that? That's the, the diameter of the moon, right? Now, how big is that diameter? You can ask Siri, how big is the diameter of the moon? So it's about, is about 2,000 miles, which in, so 3.4, 3.5 million meters or so. And then what about how far it is from Earth? So I wanna know how far this thing is. This distance from here to the moon, it's about, 385 million meters. So then I say, you know, how big is this angle here? How big is this angle in degrees? Let me call it theta moon. How big is this in degrees? So it turns out there is a, this relationship here that's gonna help us. It's a relationship that is called the arc length. You know, how do I figure out the arc length? So suppose this angle here is theta, just any angle, and this radius here is r. That makes this r too. And this sort of slice of pizza, I'm trying to measure out, anybody like stuffed crust pizza? Suppose I wanna measure out how long this stuffed crust pizza. I wanna measure out how long this stuffed crust is, right? Now, obviously that's gonna depend on what size pizza I got, right? Because that's gonna be, you know, if I, if I got a medium, then it's gonna be this size. If I got a large, then it's gonna be this size, right? 
So obviously it's gonna depend on the radius here. Is it this big or is it this big? So S is gonna be, turns out it's gonna be proportional to the radius. It's also gonna depend on the angle here because the angle of the slice matters. If I make this a big slice, or if I make this you know, a smaller slice, if this is a smaller angle, then this would be a smaller length. So it also depends on the angle and turns out that it's exactly the relationship says that the arc length or the length of the crust is how big the angle is multiplied by the radius but this angle has to be in radians. So if the, if the radius is in meters, then the arc length would be in meters and so on. So S here is something that I'm calling the arc length. So if R is in meters, S also comes out in meters. And by the way, you know this relationship in one, at least one insta instance, you know this relationship. You know this in the case of a full pizza. I wanna measure the crust of the whole thing. I know what that is, that's called the circumference. If this is the radius r, then the circumference here I know is two pi r. See, that's exactly the circumference here is, is the s in this case, it's the arc length, the length of the whole thing, that's c. And the angle here is the angle and radians of this whole thing, which is two pi. In general, it turns out that that's true. If you wanna know the length of the crust, you can figure out the length of the, the arc length by multiplying the subtended angle multiplied by the radius. So that hopefully is gonna help us here when we're thinking about the moon problem. Because I can come back and I think about this, what am I trying to find? I'm trying to find the angle, theta here. And I know S in this case, that's the arc length that's the size of the crust, but the size of the crust here is the diameter of the moon. And then the R here is the radius, and the radius here is the radius of the orbit of the moon. It's this, the distance from here to the moon. So then I can say that the arc length, which is the diameter of the moon, is equal to the angle subtended by the moon, theta m, times the radius, and the radius is the distance from here to the moon. That's the radius of the orbit of the moon as it goes around like that. So the angle then would be the ratio of the sides because if I divide both sides by the distance, then I get the diameter of the moon divided by the distance from here to the moon. The diameter of the moon is roughly, we said, you know what, I, I think it's a little bit more than that, but 3.45 maybe times 10 to the six meters divided by 385 times 10 to the six meters. I mean, I typically would write this as 3.85 times 10 to the eight meters. This looks easier to write because then I can just cancel these together. And I get about 1%, right? Three divided by 385. So that's 0 0.009 radians or about 1%, like we said. Well, the conversion is like we used to do all the time. You have to multiply by some ratio that gets rid of the one you're trying to replace, and then substitutes with the one that you're looking for. So I know, for example, that uh, one radian is about 58 degrees, or the easier one that I know, the easiest one I, that I know is this one here, a full circle. Full circle is two pi radians and 360 degrees. So this factor here that is written red, that's factor of one. So that doesn't change the answer. All it does is just changes the unit. So the radian cancels with the radian, and I'm left with degrees here, but that be multiplied by 360, and then divided by pi, which is about one degree. So the angle subtended by the moon is about one degree. Actually, can we do the sun too? Can we figure out the angle subtended by the sun? So again, we're gonna to have to find these two distances again. The distance from here to the sun and the diameter of the sun. 
So again, to convert it, obviously it's gonna give me the same answer, 360 degrees for two pi radians. It's the same exact number, same conversion. So again, it's one degrees. Well, hang on a second. I could have figured this out before, because with them standing here, sometimes the sun is there. Sometimes what happens is that the moon comes in here exactly the same size in terms of angular size, and it blocks out the whole sun. We call that the eclipse, the solar eclipse, when the moon blocks out the whole sun, and it's perfectly the same exact size. And that's because they're subtended by exactly the same angle. Even though the size of the sun is so big compared to the size of the moon, about 400 times as big as the moon. The sun is about 400 times as big as the moon. And the distance from here to the sun is also about 400 times as big as the distance from here to the moon. And that's a coincidence, by the way. It didn't have to be that way. That the distance from here to the sun is exactly 400 times the distance from here to the moon. And the size of the moon compared to the size of the sun is, all, is also one to 400. So these two numbers um, makes you think. Okay, so this whole story was a fun story. And the main thing that it told us is this piece that I can relate this linear variable, which is some length here called the arc length. So that's a linear variable. That's not an angle. This is the angle. The angle is theta, some that subtended by this thing. So S is equal to theta times R. So that's one thing we learned, that the linear variable is equal to the angular variable times the radius. And the other thing we learned in this piece, or I guess not learned, but like practiced again, is the unit conversion. You have radians, you have revolutions, which is two pi radians. You have a circle, which is the same as a revolution, right? It's just the full thing. Anything that measures angles really uh, can be converted to one of these. Okay. And this is the piece that we just talked about, which is that theta in radians is equal to the arc length, the pizza crust divided by the radius of the pizza. So that was the first thing that we covered, angular displacement. And that was analogous to linear displacement. Now the question that we asked after the displacement when we were studying kinematics is we asked the question of what happens when the displacement changes as time passes? So when the position of the object changes as time passes, we call that the velocity. Now we're thinking about the angular position is changing as time passes. So how do we describe that? We call it the angular velocity. So again, the definition that we defined before was the average velocity. Now we define the average angular velocity. And again, it's the displacement over time was the story that we had before, right? When, when I was thinking about linear variables. Now when I'm thinking about these variables, I say, oh no, you know what, it's the angular one. So the angular velocity average is the angular displacement divided by the time. And we use the letter omega to represent the angular velocity. So what used to be V now is omega. And the position there is now theta. That, that was the previous thing. So this is displacement, angular displacement, or, or position, angular position, and then velocity, angular velocity. These are, as you can see, Latin, and these are Greek, and that trend is going to continue. But that's, this is what we're talking about now, the angular velocity, and that's defined as the angular displacement as time passes by. So the rate of change of angular displacement. That's, so you can go very slow like that, or you can go very fast and do the same change of angle in a small amount of time, so you're going very fast, or in a long amount of time, so you're going around very slow. And the SI units then would be the SI units for the angular displacement, which is radians, the SI unit for time, which is seconds, so I get radians per second, which we write like this, radians per second. And then we can talk about the instantaneous angular velocity, which is, 
take the average velocity and think about a time that is very, very short. So I'm asking you, what is your velocity right now? Which is really an, a question about what is your average velocity between now and a uh, from now, right? Because as we've talked about before, there's no such thing as zero time, zero time interval. Um, when, you, when it comes to talking about velocity, you can't talk about, you can't take a picture of somebody and ask me how fast is it going. You have to see it as it's moving. And then you ask how fast is it going? And so the question of how fast is something going right now is a question of how fast is it going between now and a hoop from now? Hoop unit of time that is undefined. Very small, very, very small. Okay, and then I can, again, with analogy to the stuff we, we did before is that changing velocity means acceleration. So now changing angular velocity means angular acceleration. So you could be going around the bend, let's say, you know, you could be driving around the curve or something like that. And instead of staying the whole time with the same velocity, you could be speeding up, okay? Or you could be, you know, think of a dancer or, or an ice skater that is rotating around and is rotating around going faster and faster or slower and slower. So these things could change. The angular velocity could change. And the change in the average, uh, in the velocity, we call that acceleration. And we use the letter alpha to play this game, to represent this story. So, you know, again, X became theta, V became omega, and, uh, and became, of course, I mean analogous to, right? And then uh, the acceleration A is analogous to the angular acceleration A. These two are really intimately related. The column on the left and the column on the right are intimately related. And the average acceleration, again, is the change in angular velocity per unit time. So that's radians per second, SI units divided by seconds. So it's radians per second per second or radians per second squared. And again, the instantaneous one would be when you take the limit. But you know, we never talk about, in this class, we don't talk about the changing acceleration. So we're gonna stop there and we're gonna say the average acceleration is the same as the instantaneous acceleration, is the same as the acceleration at every point because that's, um, that's pretty much what we're gonna study in this story. So the, the acceleration is the same as the instantaneous as the average, they're all the same. And it's the change in velocity, in angular velocity in this case, divided by that. Okay, let's work on a problem here, um, a quick problem, and then we'll take a short break and then uh, we'll come back and finish this. So here's, the, here's a quick example here. It says, um, a scene from the front of the engine, of a jet engine here. The fan blades of this jet engine are rotating with an angular speed that is given. Well, it really should say, if it's gonna give you the negative sign, that's the direction information, it really should say velocity here. Because that sign here is a direction information. If you remember, we just agreed that positive is this way, negative is this way. So if I'm looking at it from the front, of the, en of the engine, you know, you can see that it's rotating in this direction. So that's the direction that we're calling negative rotation. But again, it's a convention, you know, so we're gonna stick with that convention so that we're, we don't get confused. But this negative here is direction information. So this should say angular velocity really. As the plane takes off, the angular velocity of the blades reach a higher angular velocity of 330 radian per second, but in the same direction still in a time of 14 seconds. Find the angular acceleration, assuming it to be constant. Okay, so if the angular acceleration is constant, that means that the instantaneous one is the same as the average one. So I can always calculate the average acceleration by saying it's the change in angular velocity divided by the time interval. So it's the final angular velocity minus the initial angular velocity divided by the time interval. So that's negative 330 radians per second. That's the final minus the initial, which is negative 110 radians per second divided by 14 seconds. So then if you put this together, you get negative 330 minus minus or minus negative is positive. So this is positive 110. So this is negative 220 divided by 14. 
So this is going to come out obviously negative, and it's going to come out as radians per second squared, radians per second per second. 22, you know, I could calculate how big this fraction is. But in my mind, I know what this is. I know this is 22 divided by 7 is pi. You don't really need to remember this, but this is just how I'm going to do it. I know that 22 over 7, like honestly, this step is a completely sort of self-indulgent, uh, not necessary step, but I like to do it. So 22 over 7 is pi. And then uh, 10 is left up here and 2 is left down here. So this is 5. So this is 5 pi. So the average acceleration says that your velocity is going to change by 5 pi in the clockwise direction, 5 pi radians per second every second. 